So let me pray, and we're going to be looking um, at 1 Kings 15 and also 2 Chronicles 13 this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much um, for your life that you have given us in Christ. Lord, I'm just always reminded that, uh, of just the truism that the one who gave his life um, for us has given his life to us, that he might live his life through us. And Lord, that really just um, says your whole heart, God, that you love us, you gave your son for us, that he might live in us, and that he might live his life through us. And we want to just hear your voice, God, and yield to you in faith and obedience to all that you would say to us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you look at 1 Kings chapter 15, I've been kind of marching through Kings a little bit when I've been with you guys. And, um, and this is a section now where if, if you kind of feel like you're, you've gone from one mountain peak down now into the valley a little bit, and we're coming up to another mountain peak, and those two big peaks being um, King Solomon on the front end of 1 Kings, and on the back end, um, Kings, well, King Ahab and the prophet Elijah. And most of 1 Kings is about Solomon and about Elijah or Ahab, who was at the same time as Elijah. And then you've got these chapters in between, and they're important. It's easy to skip over them, but I'm always reminded that all Scripture is inspired by God, and it's all profitable. And so we don't want to um, skip over this. God's put it here, and He wants us to, to listen to it and to, and to learn from it. And so to give you a bit of background before we get in here to, to introducing King Abijam here in chapter um, 15 of 1 Kings, Solomon is dead. Rehoboam has already died, Solomon's son, the first man to take the throne after Solomon. And under Rehoboam's reign, the kingdom split. The people came to Rehoboam. They asked for the taxes to be lowered. Rehoboam said, not doing it. He took the tough posture rather than the weak posture, and it resulted in the kingdom being divided. Ten tribes went to the north with King Jeroboam, two tribes to the south, forming the new kingdom of Judah, and that being um, Judah and Benjamin. And so, and during all the days of Rehoboam, basically, and now all the days of Abijam, there's been constant warfare between this King Jeroboam and the kings of Judah. Jeroboam, as soon as he became king, he realized that he would not be able to hold the kingdom together. At least he thought this. It wasn't actually true what he was thinking, because God said that he would secure the kingdom for Jeroboam if he walked with him. Jeroboam didn't walk with God, had no relationship with God, and so he felt that he had to secure the kingdom in his own strength. And so he established a false alternate worship system to the worship of God in Jerusalem. So he set up two golden calves, one in Dan, one in Babylon. And he said, these are the gods that brought you up out of Egypt. And so the people turned to worshiping those gods. Now, another interesting thing that's happening during this time is that all the faithful priests that were up in Israel, they, they jump ship. And they go, why would we want to be up here? This guy has abandoned the Lord. He's set up these, these alternate worship systems, and, and it's just, God is absolutely um, opposed to what's going on here. And so the good and faithful priest, they left their properties behind, and they all migrated south to Judah. And so even though J Judah under Rehoboam and under Abijam are not really walking with the Lord, they're not as they should be, nonetheless, things are good in Judah. And it's because they have not completely forsaken the Lord. And all these priests, godly men, have come down into Judah, and they're having a major impact upon the spiritual health of the nation, even though the kings are not really directing um, the kingdom toward the Lord, so the kings being Rehoboam and Abijam. And so that's a bit of the background here. And as we come to chapter 15, it says, Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abijam became king over Judah. And he reigned three years in Jerusalem. So that's a short reign. His mother's name was Maka, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, speaking of Rehoboam, whom he had committed before him. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, like the heart of his father David. Now that's basically all he, God has to say about Abijam in 1 Kings. But when you go to 2 Chronicles, there's a lot more. And the reason for that is the, is the writer of the Chronicles, he wanted to focus on the line of David. And so anytime we see in Kings a son of David mentioned, 
Chronicles has a lot more to say about it. First Kings wants to talk about all the kings of both north and south. Second Chronicles zeroes in on the kings of David. So there's a lot more. But if all we had was 1 Kings 15, and this is the only information we had about Abijam, we would walk away saying this man was clearly not a good man, right? He walked in all the sins of his father which he had committed before him. His heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God like the heart of his father David. So that's a pretty definite summary statement here that this man does not know the Lord and he is definitely not one of the eight good kings of Israel. So let me just review about that. Sorry there's so much review here, but it's important to, to get the context. There were 20, 19 kings and one queen in Judah after Solomon. And there were 20 kings in Israel from Jeroboam to the end. Of all those kings, only eight are listed in the Bible as good kings. And those eight were all in Judah. Now, they're not listed as good kings because they were successful politically. But they're called good because of a relationship they had with God. And the gold standard of being good is David. He set the high water mark. And so you'll see each of these kings, even the bad ones oftentimes, are being compared against David. And so as with Abijam, it says, his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God like the heart of his father David. And so David becomes the standard. And when all these kings are evaluated on the basis of David, only eight, God says, these were good. So what makes a man or a woman good? We should ask. And obviously, only God is good. Remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, Good teacher, how might I et uh, obtain eternal life? And Jesus stopped him and said, Why do you call me good? There is only one that is good, and that is God. And so for, for a man or woman to be good in the sight of God, he has to be in a relationship with God. He has to have placed his trust in God for the forgiveness of his sins and to have received that gift of eternal life. And so I believe that the eight good kings, and I'm not alone with this, those eight good kings were all men that we will see in heaven. They were good because of their relationship with God. They were not perfect. God's not saying that. They were not without sin. God's not saying they were without sin. But he's speaking about their, their faith in the Lord. That they were men of re that had a relationship with God. They were men of faith, just as David was. Now, one more observation here. I've been teaching kings multiple times a year for the last 35 years. And it wasn't until recently that I thought, you know, it, it doesn't say they were not wholly committed to the Lord. It says they were not wholly devoted to the Lord. Maybe there's a difference between commitment and devotion. So I'm still exploring this. Maybe you can do it with me. Get out your concordances and look up the word commit and the word devote. What I'm finding is there's virtually nothing in the Bible about commitment. It's about devotion. And even when you come to the New Testament, we are not exhorted to be committed to Jesus, but we are exhorted to love him as he has first loved us. Now, I think that commitment is involved in devotion, but devotion doesn't spring from, doesn't start with the will. It springs out of love. My wife doesn't want me just to be committed to her. She wants me to be devoted to her. And I think we understand that there's a love aspect to devotion that's not necessarily in commitment. And so when you see back in Deuteronomy, God says, the Lord, behold, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And then he says in the next verse, therefore, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. And so the idea there, I think, is one of devotion, that out of love, that every aspect of your being be devoted to the one who loves you. And David, if anything, he was a man who loved God. Was he committed? Yes, he was committed to the Lord. But it sprang out of a love relationship 
with the Lord. And so I wonder if this is why over and over and over again, God says that these other kings were either, either were or were not devoted to the Lord. Never once uses the word commitment, but devoted to the Lord. Now this is, again, so this is God's commentary on this man's life. He, was, he walked in all the sins of his father and that his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord. This is helpful because otherwise, if all we had was Second Chronicles, we would think this man was a good man. Look at Second Chronicles with me. So this guy is, is a bit of an enigma. He's one of these people that preachers hate to do their funerals for. <laughs> okay, because you can, I've done these funerals where you just, you didn't know the guy personally and nobody in his family can necessarily say that he received Christ, yet he lived a pretty good life. Or maybe it's one of those guys where everybody in the family says, you know, he professed faith in Christ when he was a kid, but we never saw any evidence of it for the rest of his life. Those are difficult people to do funerals for. Because you don't want to put them in heaven if they're not in heaven, and you don't want to put them in hell if they're not in hell, right? And so it's very hard to do funerals of people where you just don't know where they stand with the Lord. Abijam would have been one of those guys if all we had was Second Chronicles. So look at Second Chronicles with me, chapter 13. Second Chronicles 13. It says then, we're going to pick this up in verse 4. Then Abijah, uh, the, this name switches, and, but it's the same person, Abijam, Abijah, same person. Then Abijah stood on Mount um, Zimmerim, which is on the hill, in the hill country of Ephraim, and he said, listen to me, Jeroboam, and all Israel. Now what happened here is that Abijam has gone up to Ephraim, not very far away from Jerusalem, just to the north of Jerusalem, and he looks like he's picking a battle with Jeroboam. Problem is, Abijam only has 400,000 warriors, and Jeroboam has twice as many, 800,000. But he's in the territory of Ephraim, and now he's going to give a little pre-war speech, history lesson here to Jeroboam before they go to battle. Now, I don't know why he's gone to battle. Some historians think that he may have been trying to reconstitute the kingdom, to bring all 12 tribes back together. But whatever reason, we don't know, but we do know Abijam knows his history. He understands the spiritual heritage of Israel. He's not ignorant about this. So he says in verse 5, Do you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the rule over Israel forever to David, his sons, by a, kingdom, by a covenant of salt? Amen. Now, there's no covenant of salt mentioned in the Old Testament. But what we think that Abijah is saying is this covenant that God made with David is to be as permanent, as la everlasting as salt is. Salt is one of the most stable compounds there is, I've been told. I am not a chemist, but that's what I've been told is that salt is a very stable compound. And so the point being is that just as salt is extremely stable, that God has made a covenant with David that is not going to go away. And he's right. And then he says in verse 6, Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his master. And worthless men gathered about him, scoundrels who proved too strong for Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when he was young and timid and could not hold his own against them. So now you intend to resist the kingdom of the Lord through the sons of David being great in number and having with you through the golden calves which Jeroboam made for God's for you. Verse 9, Have you not driven out the priest of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and they had, and made for yourself priests like the people of other lands, and they had, whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams, even he may become a priest of what are no gods. But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. Remember 1 Kings 13, he walked in all the sins of his father. And yet this man is standing there saying, we haven't forsaken God. And so you see this is a bit of an you know, enigma here. What's going on? And so he says, we've not forsaken God. You have. And the sons of Aaron are ministering to the Lord as priests, and the Levites attend to their work. 
And every morning they burn to the Lord burnt offerings and, and fragrant incense, and the showbread is set on the clean table, and the golden lampstand with its lamps is ready to light every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. Now, if this is all you had of this man and you were doing, your, doing his funeral, you'd go, he's in heaven, right? But that's not, not according to 1 Kings. He did not walk in the ways of his father David. He was not wholly devoted to the Lord. He walked in all the sins of his father Rehoboam. But this man knows his theology. And he knows that Israel has not rejected the Lord, at least in terms of religion. Now behold, God is with us at our head and his priest with the signal trumpets to sound the alarm against you. O sons of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you will not succeed. But while he's talking, Jeroboam is setting an ambush. Verse 13. Jeroboam had set an ambush to come from the rear, so that Israel was in front of Judah, and the ambush was behind him. And when Judah turned around, behold, they were attacked from both front and rear. So they cried to the Lord, and the priests blew the trumpets. And, the, and, and then the men of Judah raised a war cry. And when the men of Judah raised the war cry, then it was that God routed Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijam and Judah. God routed them. And when the sons of Israel fled before Judah, God gave them into their hand. And Abijah and his people defeated them with a great slaughter, so that 500,000 chosen men of Israel fell slain. Thus the sons of Israel were subdued at that time, and the sons of Judah conquered, because they trusted in the Lord, the God of their fathers. Wow. So, hard two passages to reconcile. Second Chronicles, man, this guy is on top of the world. God is with us, and, and we're trusting God, and God gave them victory because they trusted in God. First Kings, you're not going to see him in heaven. Not one of the eight good kings. So what is going on? Hard passage to look at. But I think it's worth just, again, just, just looking at this and thinking on it. Just about everything that, that Abijah says to Israel is true. I think he he's, um, doesn't see the whole picture, but what he's saying on the whole is very accurate. And, and yet we're stuck with what God said about this man. Walked in all the sins of his father. Heart not wholly devoted to the Lord God. I wonder if what we see under... Abijam at this time in history, if it's not parallel to what was going on in the days of Jesus with the religious leadership then, even with King Herod, who was nobody would say, we're going to see Herod in heaven, right? Evil man, ruthless man. But Herod recognized the religion of Israel. And he had some respect and some deference for what was going on there. He wanted to get along, best I can tell, with the priest and all. He knew he could only go so far. And so he was not out there trying to overthrow the priesthood or set up an alternate worship system. And here's Abijam, not trying to overthrow the priesthood, not, over, not trying to set up an alternate worship system. And yet it just seems that everything that he says that he knows is true is lip service. It's not a heart reality with him. He is not devoted to the Lord. He is walking in the sins of his father. But he knows the truth. He knows exactly what the distinction is between Israel and Judah. And it is the worship of God. Nothing else. So here's some things that, that come to mind for me as I think on Abijam. I think we can clearly say, God remains faithful to his covenant, and in this respect it's the covenant to David, regardless of the spiritual condition of his people. Bajam's right. We are in a covenant relationship with God, and he was banking on that. Now, he was also presuming upon it, right? Because though he recognizes we are under, in a covenant relationship with God, 
that a son of David is sitting on the throne just as the Davidic covenant said would happen. He was not himself walking with God. So he acknowledged on the one hand the Davidic covenant, the promise, the faithfulness of God, but on the other hand, he was just living an evil life. So he is presuming upon the grace of God. Knows that the covenant, God will honor it because God is a faithful God. But living in a way that is untrue to God. Because God is faithful to his covenant, regardless of the spiritual condition of his people. He doesn't ignore the spiritual condition of his people. But even when his people are faithless, God remains faithful. He will always be true to his covenant, and he is still to this day. But because of God's faithfulness, and because God is blessing Judah, it's sometimes hard to know what the true spiritual condition is of the people that God uses to accomplish his purposes. Again, if all we had was Second Chronicles, and we see that God is blessing Judah, and we are always tempted to equate blessing with approval, then we would think that God approves of Abijam. But that's not true. God is not pleased with that man. But he is blessing him. He blesses him because of the Davidic covenant because of his commitment to Israel. And Abijam is reaping the benefit of that. But that doesn't mean that God is pleased with him. I often try to um, talk to our students at His Hill because this is an important point when it comes to um, evaluating what God is doing in ministries. Because we're tempted to think that ministries are big because God is happy with what's going on there. Why would he be blessing them if he's not happy with them? And if ministries are small, it's because there must be something wrong. Nothing many times could be further from the truth. Many times the greatest things that God is doing in this world are through ministries that we have never heard about. I am fully convinced of that. And I'm convinced that we will stand before the Lord in glory and it'll be saints that no one ever heard about who will be receiving the greatest honor and praise in heaven. It's through the least that God often does the most. He wants us to get out of the way and be nothing so that God can be everything. And when he's being everything, that doesn't mean he's going to necessarily shine the spotlight on us and give us great recognition. Sometimes he does. There are ministries that are big ministries because God is pleased with what's going on there. But I'm reminded of where Paul talks about the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians. And he says in chapter 12, he says, just in terms of spiritual gifts, it is the Spirit that gives the gifts. And the Spirit also determines the ministry that will come from that gift. And the Spirit determines the effect of that ministry. So the ministry itself, the gift itself, the ministry and the effect are all determined by God. I believe we can hinder what God's doing, but we can't um, make God do more than what he wants to do. The gift, the ministry, the effect are all the doing of God. And, and so we can't judge a ministry as being ineffective because it's small. That's God's business. They may be everything God wants them to be and never be big. It's God's determination. And so we need to learn to think and to look at what's going on here, not simply by what looks like blessing because there's lots of people or lots of money. Noses and nickels don't equate with necessarily God's approval. What is God doing? And when we look at Abijam here, he is a man who that God clearly blessed, at least at this one time when it came to this battle. 500,000 men are killed. God did this. God gave the victory because they trusted in God. But this was not a faithful man. He was not a man who had turned away from the sins of his father. He was walking wholesale into them. Unsaved men, evil men, as in the case of Abijam, clearly can know the faithfulness of God and can be used by God. 
any of us that have, or if you're even a partial student of history, you know that God can use scoundrels to accomplish his purposes, right? God is not limited by that kind of vessel. That God can use the most unlikely of people to accomplish his purposes. And this man, Abijam, not one of the eight, but he knows the truth of God's word, his theology is correct, and he is used by God, but he is not a man who is walking with God. God will always act in the interest of his covenant people. Judah, Israel, his covenant people. Christians, the body of Christ, his covenant people. And God will always act in our interest. Acting in the interest of his people means both defending them and disciplining them. On this occasion, God is defending his covenant people, as it were, from the rebellious people who are also his covenant people. In many other times throughout the history of kings, he is disciplining them. And why? Because they are his covenant people. And it's the same for you and I. He will both protect us and he will discipline us. We see from this that God hears those who cry to him. Everyone. I'm a bit troubled sometimes when I hear people say that God hears only the prayers of the righteous. God hears all, and God is good to all. Now, he is not bound to answer favorably all the prayers of anybody. We have to pray according to his will, according to his word, in humility and dependence upon him, and we will see God answer those prayers. But God does hear those who cry out to him. Abijam cries out, and God hears. Unbelievers, as we see with Abijam, can know the Bible and what it teaches. They can apprehend some spiritual truth. I know that 1 Corinthians chapter um, um, 2, Paul writes and says that, that, that the natural man cannot understand spiritual things. I believe that what he's saying is that it's not that you can't understand the words on the page, but he can't fully grasp how that is to be applied to him apart from the Spirit of God. But a natural man, an unbeliever, knows when it says, thou shalt not steal, that means that you can't just walk into the store and take anything you want out of the store. You don't have to be a Christian to understand what, that, what, what you shall not steal means. But how it applies to you and be convicted over it takes the Spirit of God. So unbelievers can know the Bible and what it teaches. I have a good friend that went all the way through seminary got his master's in divinity, was pastoring his first church, and um, was attending on a monthly basis a ministerial alliance luncheon that the pastors in that major city had. And over the course of the time that he was there, there was another pastor who got to make friends with, with my friend and realized this man does not know Jesus. And so he began witnessing to him, explaining the gospel to him. My friend got saved. He's already a seminary graduate pastoring a, pastoring a church. Not saved. I, a few years ago, I was listening to the radio back home, and there was a woman giving her testimony on the radio, and she said how she had written a curriculum on how to evangelize um, other people, how to share the gospel, some kind of curriculum that she had written. And she said, while she was herself on, listening to um, her part of her, one of her, her recorded messages come across the radio about how to share the gospel, this woman who wrote that, listening to herself, got saved. She wasn't even a Christian when she wrote that. Astounding. But we know that a person who is dead spiritually... That does not mean they have no understanding that there is a God, that they can have no um, 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 response to God. 
To be spiritually dead, and oh, Bob Wilkin, who's coming next week, talks a lot about this, doesn't mean that, you, that the unbeliever is unable to respond to God. That is not what spiritually dead means. It means he's separated from God. When Adam took of the fruit, he was spiritually dead at that moment. And yet we see him interacting and responding to God in the garden after he took the fruit. So a person like Abijam, who it would seem does not know the Lord, doesn't mean that he knows nothing about the Lord. Doesn't mean his theology is even all wrong. Furthermore, I think that Abijam is an example that we can trust in religion. We can trust in our religious activity, our religious accuracy, and not be trusting in God. This was the situation with the Pharisees, wasn't it? Religious people, by and large, theologically correct people, but they did not trust in God. And they rejected the Messiah when he was offered to them. The form and content of one's theology can be correct, and the heart can be far from God. God can be acknowledged in our behavior, but forsaken in our hearts. Think about Nebuchadnezzar. Boy, that's an interesting character. I think I'll be preaching through Daniel next when I'm finishing my current series back home. And, I, and I, he's, he's such an interesting guy. But before, in his first encounter with, with Daniel, remember, can, can you tell me the dream and its interpretation? And Daniel does. And what's Nebuchadnezzar's response? Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. And then, next chapter, Daniel's friends are being thrown into the fiery furnace. Remember? And God protects them. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, there is no other God who can deliver in this way. But by all reckoning, Nebuchadnezzar was not yet saved. Not declared righteous, reckoned righteous as Abraham had been reckoned righteous. And yet he's saying good things, true things as an unbeliever. Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. There is no other God who can deliver in this way. But in the next chapter, after he's been put out to pasture literally for seven years and he's eating grass like a cow... And then he lifts up his eyes and gives praise to God, and his mind returns to him. And in that, and it's interesting to me, it appears that that whole chapter is written by Nebuchadnezzar. And if he's not a believer, then you've got an entire chapter of the Bible written by an unbeliever. I don't think so. I think Nebuchadnezzar is writing now as a believer. And at the end of that chapter, he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true, and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. That sounds to me like a man who's come to faith. Uh, Wonderful. Yes. Not an Abijam. Abijam had a lot of accurate knowledge, but he walked in all the sins of his father before him. In God's commentary on his life, not wholly devoted to the Lord as God. We see here that they both cried out to God and they raised the battle cry. I think sometimes as Christians we think it's one or the other. You know, we cry out to God, but we don't engage with the responsibilities that God's given us. We've got an election coming up at the end of this year. We can cry out to God. God, have your will done. Put the right man in office. But then we don't vote. It's both. Cry out to God and raise the battle cry. We need to be involved as well as cry out to God. Abijam, as I've been saying, was never called good. Although in this one instance, it says he trusted in God. All Israel, all Judah trusted in God for this battle. Ultimately, knowing who's saved is obviously God's business. And I'm glad for that. When I officiate a funeral, it's not my job to put people in heaven or put them in hell. All I can say is, I don't know the whole story here, but I know this. 
if there was ever even a single moment as a child or as an adult, we may not know about it, but this person trusted in Jesus Christ alone for the gift of eternal life, then this person is saved. But that doesn't mean that they necessarily demonstrated it, lived like it. On the other hand, just because this person went to church their whole life doesn't make them a Christian. And I can't put that person in heaven because he lived a good moral life, loved his wife, loved his kids, and went to church every Sunday. But he never gave any acknowledgement of a relationship with Jesus. It just wasn't there. We've had that with sometimes students that come to us in Bible school. They all have to fill out applications when they come to school. And, um, and they, tell, they, they give their testimonies. But pretty much every year there will be one or two that gets to Bible school in very short order. They recognize that they don't know Jesus and they never have known Jesus. And they receive Christ while they're with us. They grew up in Christian homes. An unsaved man who knows the truth is an unenviable man. He knows the truth, but he is not saved. I read a commentary recently as I'm preaching through James, and the author said, if I were to go to hell, I would not want to enter as a rich man because he's got more accountability for what he could have done with his wealth, and he hoarded it instead of giving it away. So he says, hell's going to be hotter for the rich man than for the poor man. To go to hell, to an eternal destination, eternally separated from God, having known the truth, is the worst possible way to enter into eternity. Much more accountability to the one that much has been given much is required. So I read about Ab Abijam, and honestly, my heart trembles a little bit over him. If all I had was Second Chronicles, I'd go, good man. But First Kings says, not a good man. God's commentary on him, never walked with God. Walked in all the sins of his father. It would appear that this is a man who knew the truth and yet never placed his faith, never received the offer that was being given to him. Sad story. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you've given us. It's, um, these are the hard passages, God, um, where the certain points in a person's life seem to um, point to faith. And yet, the overall commentary that you've given is lack of faith, if I'm reading it correctly. But God, I know that you're the one who knows these things, and it's ultimately not our business to put people in heaven or hell. But we know the truth of what you've said, God, and that is that salvation is in Jesus Christ and in his name only. And that you are looking for all not to be good, not to be committed, but you're looking for faith that receives the gift that has been offered. And we thank you, Jesus, for yourself, for giving yourself to us, and for that gift of eternal life that you have blessed us with as we simply said thank you to the offer. In Jesus' name, amen.